Yes. Okay, great. All right, at 7 o'clock, I'm going to call the uh, meeting together for the uh, September 23rd, 2021 meeting of the uh, Rollinsford uh, Zoning Board of Adjustment. Uh, Sarah, would you please read the application? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So before we begin um, with the presentation by Attorney Lanzetta, uh, so I had previously recused myself from this matter, um, and then we received uh, communications from Attorney Lanzetta's office that he didn't want to proceed with just four uh, members of the board. And so um, I asked him if he, or I had through Sarah, asked Attorney Lanzetta if he was comfortable or uh, he wanted me to unrecuse myself. Um, and before I ask him that question, I will say that the basis of my recusal uh, was that I have uh, represented uh, in the past individually uh, Mr. and Mrs. Norton. Um, the last representation was probably four to five years ago. It did not involve the town in any way, shape, or form. So the way I'm going to uh, proceed is first see if Attorney Lanzetta is comfortable uh, going forward and then I'm going to ask the board if they're comfortable with me sitting on that afterwards. So, Attorney Lanzetta, have you uh, discussed uh, the issue of my uh, prior recusal with your with your client? And um, has your client made it? Is your com client comfortable uh, going forward with me sitting on the board and, and uh, participating, or would you rather go forward with four members tonight? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I did speak with Mr. Norton today about this. Uh, and he is comfortable proceeding with you on the board. Okay, all right. And I'm going to go ahead and poll each member just to make sure we're, we're okay. On um, this cast, do you have an opinion on whether or not I should, uh, whether you think I should uh, sit as a, on the matter tonight or not? I'm comfortable with you sitting as long as the applicant, which okay. is stated that he is comfortable. All right. Herb, how do you feel about that? I have no comment. All right. Uh, Mr. Leach? I'm fine as long as the applicant is. Okay, Ms. Mears? I'm fine. Okay, all right. So, Thank you. We'll proceed then. Um, and uh, Attorney Lanzetta, please make your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Josh Lanzetta. Uh, our, I'm an attorney at Blue Time and Ruby. For the record, our address is 601 Central Avenue in Dover, New Hampshire. Uh, uh, with me this evening to my left is Chris Ferry from Barry Surgery and Engineering. Their address is 335 Pounds Point Road in Barrington, New Hampshire. Uh, as you know, I'm here tonight uh, representing uh, Leslie Norton, as you know him to be in lead, uh, in relation to a variance application to permit uh, multiple dwelling units on this property. <coughs> this has been a long-standing um, issue with the town, that of um, some errant lot lines and also various dwelling units and the commercial use on Mr. Norton's property uh, for decades, really. Um, and my hope tonight is to come to a reasonable resolution with the town um, with this variance, uh, if you're inclined to uh, approve it. Uh, and then also another ancillary proceeding would be uh, a lot more adjustment with the planning board. So we are asking that you approve the variance tonight, and I'll explain why we think that's a reasonable uh, idea. And I'm suggesting um, respectfully that that would be contingent on the applicant then appearing in front of the planning board to complete a lot line adjustment. Um, I'll, Chris and I will explain the plans here in a second. Um, I'm going to go through a really quick digital presentation. I apologize for the, the tech um, 
I did bring a TV to try to compensate for this, but I have a 17 inch monitor. I think this is probably good in a small setting. We'll go through a number of aerial uh, pictures of the property. Uh, we'll come down to the street level to view the property, and then I did film on my iPhone a virtual site walk just to familiarize everyone with the property and its current conditions. All the photos that you see were taken today um, and off of the internet yesterday. So everything is as current as I can get it. And I apologize probably to Michelle here in advance. She's seen me do this kind of dog and pony show with other applications. So I'll try not to bore you guys too much tonight. Um, before I kind of jump into the meat of it, um, the applicant owns four lots on Clement Road. His family has owned these lots for decades, a very long time. I think 97 years is what we represented. Um, and I think the deeds actually go back a little further than that. The lots are all oddly shaped, and they were shaped before Rollinsburg had a zoning ordinance. As you know, zoning ordinances kind of started around the, the 60s, 1962, uh, generally in the country. And the intent of an ordinance is to classify areas of a town and or properties, and it's essentially an overlay map that lays this kind of rubric over some sort of topography. And it can often create nonconformities in lots, especially in New England where we have this meets and bounds um, method of quantifying property boundaries, you know, left at the oak tree, then to Mrs. Smith's barn, and you know, that sort of thing. And I think that over time, what's happened is the ordinance has changed a little bit, and the uses is the family used all of these properties in essentially a home state. You'll see that there are outbuildings and various buildings all over the property that were added over the years, um, has created some nonconformities that we're trying to rectify. So again, this is kind of a two-part permitting process. Our hope is that this is reasonable um, in the town's view. So let me page forward. In terms of the mindset, what was the, the term you used? I didn't quite hear. Created some what? It, it created just nonconformities with the lot lines, and then okay. also the size of the property. So the timber, the use of the property, has always been that of agricultural, residential, and then also this. It's had a long-standing commercial use that we spoke about at the beginning of the year. So it's been a property that's been utilized in different ways. And I think that as the zoning ordinance has slightly changed, it's brought the lot lines, frontages, a little further out of conformity than we'd like to see. The lot line adjustment plan, when we come back, and I'll show you that at the end of this, the plans, um, actually makes all of the lots, except for the lot 56, which is really not part of this inquiry, and I didn't include it as part of the notice. I only referenced lot 56 because it's right there. I figured if you were looking at the deeds, you might have kind of captured or, or understood, oh, there's another fourth lot here. Why aren't we talking about that? That lot, that's a lot of record. It's really not part of this. We're not proposing changes to that lot tonight in any way. Um, so a few aerials. This is just from Google Earth. If everyone can see it. Um, I've got an arrow pointed towards essentially the back of where the commercial structure is. You can see um, all of the trees kind of back here. This is all... A little bit. This is kind of all of these properties. This property is actually very deep, and he does have a, a large amount of frontage when you add all the properties together in the aggregate. This is taken from the town's tax map. This is map one. We're dealing with lot uh, 54, 54 2, and 55. Mr. Norton currently lives and has resided in, uh, in the house on lot 55, which is 230 Clement Road. Uh, we're really dealing with trying to move and enlarge lot 54-2, which is where the commercial shops, we have a mechanic shop in the front with two residences behind the mechanic shop on that property. And then a lot 54, the large lot, we have an old farmhouse that is also residential in nature. So I think this is a good illustration. So the yellow is lot 54. The green is 54-2. The tax maps are hard to read because they, you know, there are lines kind of going out. They're a little, a little tough to read. Um, lot 55 is blue, and lot 56, which is really not part of the inquiry, but owned by Mr. Norton, is the purple. Lee, in some way, over the years, um, 
basically inherited these. So he had a number of family members um, that lived on these properties. He was born in the house at Lot 55. Um, his mom lived there for a very long time. So uh, these were the four properties. This is just kind of the general outline. What you'll see in the plans, while I still have this up before we go to the street level, is that what Chris had and his staff have designed is an expansion of the blue and the green lots. So Lee's lot, lot 55, essentially um, comes northwest, the lot line goes northwest along the street on Clement Road, and that allows it to have the right amount of frontage to comply with the zoning ordinance. The, the green lot, which is lot 54-2, that small rectangle, that's where we have a structure straddling the lot line. It straddles that lot line um, to the east. Um, that lot line would be obliterated, and that lot would be substantially expanded by cannibalizing a portion of lot 54, so in the yellow. There's so much acreage here that this was relatively kind of a no-brainer. You know, we can make compliant lots, compliant with your frontage requirements, compliant with your square footage requirements. And again, which lot is going to get, is, is it proposed, will get uh, additional space from lot 54? Uh, both lot 54-2 and lot 55. Although lot, lot 55 actually is taking space from where lot 54-2 is, and then 54-2 is going to substantially expand into space that's coming from lot 54. All right, thank you. Can you elaborate, Attorney Lanzetta, what is exactly going to be the, the area of each, of the size of each lot? So 154 will expand to what acres? We have it right here, yes. So 154 is, is actually reduced in size. 154 so, is reduced to what? Yep, yeah, so 154 is reduced from 31.73 acres to 27.65 acres. Okay. And that is in an effort to make 24-2 larger in size, uh, which would then encompass the mechanic shop, the duplex, and the existing single family. So it goes from 0.59 up to what? 4.64. Uh, okay, thank you. And, then and, and the reason, uh, if I could elaborate, uh, the reason for that total lot size has to do with uh, a usable area calculation. Uh, there are some areas on the site that are not usable in your density calculation, and so that's why that lot is so much larger than it would need to be. And then lot 55, uh, goes from 1.79 to 1.80, so very, very small area. It's only a 372 square foot area of change. Thank you. That's on, uh, those numbers are also on the first page of the plan set um, that I'm going to show you that are in the packet also. Um. All right, so these are snipped also from Google Earth, just the little drop the guy onto the street. Um, I just wanted to kind of just show you where the existing curb cuts were. I will say I went there yesterday and today to try to take more photos and video, but they had a apparently a very bad accident yesterday on Clement Road um, with the paving crew. They're repaving the road, and I was not able to get onto the road at all. Today, I waited for a few hours this morning, and they did let me get to Lee's home, um, but I still couldn't get in front of the farmhouse that's on Lot 54. So. This was the best I could do to show you the curb cuts. Um, they're existing and they've been there for decades. This is, uh, you can see Mr. Norton's home here just above this tree line, and that's one of the um, barn structures on this property. Uh, I'm walking up the street um, going northwest. This then focuses um, at, it, at the home again, which is kind of back here. I just wanted to see that there is a, another driveway here, and this is going to come into the That's path. the single family home on lot uh, 54-2, is that correct? This is, so this is pointing at the single family home on lot 55, so just the opposite angle. Got that. Um, yep. We just gotcha. kind of took a, I took a vector basically from Lee's house okay. and from the two driveways. And then standing in that same position, this is looking northeast. Um, at the mechanic shop, which is here in the foreground, and you can barely see through the trees this white structure. That is the back barn that is attached or, or detached, but part of the lot 54 property. 
This is the curb cut to that single family residence on lot 54 that we're proposing to be made into lot 54. Okay. Um, the start this from here. This is going to be a quick virtual site walk starting at the curb cut to Mr. Norton's home. I tried to walk fast and I tried to pan the counter fast so we wouldn't be here for more than two minutes. So it's just a quick two minute video. That's Mr. Norton's home. I'm going to pan through. You'll see his residence. Um, the garage. And there's an apartment above that garage that is currently in use. There's another garage also. Um, an, an apartment was built in that second garage that is now not being used. This is walking around the back of Mr. Norton's home towards the mechanic shop. And you can see where um, his driveway interfaces with the driveway of the mechanic shop. That's looking across the street. Now we'll just walk across the parking lot where the commercial structure. So there's the mechanic shop. Behind those trees are the two entrances to the apartments that are attached to that shop. This is just walking towards lot 54 and the back structures, kind of barns if you will, that were built over the years. And you'll be able to see the home up here, right up here on the top of the screen. That is the residential home there. You can actually see some of the paving equipment there. That's why I couldn't get a better frontal view, so I apologize. This is just panning through lot 54. Now lot 54-2, and back to Mr. Norwood's house. Okay. So thanks for bearing with me through the pictures. I just wanted to attempt, I know it's, it's a small screen and it, there are just a few, but I, and I know you all live here and probably driven past a million times, but I just wanted to kind of get everyone oriented to what's happening out there today. That, I mean, I took that video in the hours at 11.30 this morning on my iPhone. Um, this is the plan set that's in the back of your application of our application packet. Um, I'm going to page through this. The first, the first plan page shows the lot lines as we're proposing to adjust them and they reflect the square footages that um, Chris already has, has given you. And they're also on that page. The second page of the plan set is essentially the northeastern part of lot 54 because that lot is very deep. We really don't have any inquiry or, you know, we're not really doing anything with that. So it's, it's relevant, but it's not relevant for our purposes tonight. I'm going to page through. There's one page in here that I, so I'm not an artist, but <laughs> I figured out how to use the highlighting tool in the Microsoft SNP um, application. And I just wanted to show you this is the first page with some really bad highlighting. The pink lot is lot 55. That's where the residential home is. We've swung this lot line, the northern lot line, just up the road to get the requisite frontage. And then you can still see in here the hashed mark, if you look on your plan, you'll be able to see it, of that square where the mechanic shop is. And that shows where that structure straddles that back that rear lot line, the northeast lot line. Um, and so that's basically going to be gone, or we're proposing to take that away. And then this is where that lot expands substantially and cannibalizes a portion of lot 54. Um, I think that this, or hope that this is a resolution to the ongoing issue on this property. When we looked at the table of uses, and I talked with Kevin Baum, the town attorney, about this, um, you know, 8.1 talks about multifamily dwellings. The table of uses is a little different than what the, is stated in the actual ordinance, and I think that that's probably a scrivener's error. We want to acknowledge that. 
But I think that um, regardless, this is a very reasonable approach to adjusting what has been basically, you know, a homestead property with one family for over a hundred or about a hundred years, um, and that just kind of grew in a way that doesn't fit with the ordinance as the ordinance has changed. So. With that, we'd be happy to answer questions. But again, we're asking for you to approve this tonight and would suggest that a contingency to go to the planning board with this plan, so this would be a quick turnaround, um, to resubmit this plan as a lot line adjustment. And that that would really fix the nonconformities created by these kind of errant structures that are straddling the lot lines. So. All right, thank you. Um, before I uh, ask the board, uh, if they have any questions, I'll first turn, if I could, to Mr. Clark and ask what the town's perspective, if he's aware of it, is on this proposal. And that, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this came, well, it came to light most recently, 2015, when the application or the, the applicant petitioned the planning board for the lot line adjustment. Um, in research, there was an original application for a variance from Mrs. Norton in 1991 and the zoning board at the time determined that they couldn't make a decision so they recessed the meeting and it was never reconvened uh, mrs norton didn't approach the town again it's just been sitting like that since in, until 2015 when um, mr norton came in with the lot line adjustment so at the time the select board said they understand they can't do the lot line they weren't speaking to the planning board by the way it's pretty clear in their letter um, that they can't do the lot line adjustment, but they need to pursue an avenue to get this resolved one way or another since it has been existing for a number of years. So Mr. Lanzetta, you know, all the information he gave, of course, is correct. Um, but the history is they certainly should be here for this relief. And we understand the reason for this particular plan is should the zoning board grant the variance, they will proceed to the planning board for the lot line adjustment. Um, I'd just like to emphasize what Mr. Uh, Attorney Lanzetta said about the Scribner's error. We, we did find that out just last year that the, um, the um, table of use regulations was changed in 07. But the footnotes that related to that table of use regulation were not changed. So the footnotes were still in there. So the reason this plan was proposed is that it was there was the belief that multifamily was allowed in this zone, which it had been up until 2007. So once we figured that out, we we understand it was a scrivener's error that they changed the table of use regs, did not delete the footnotes, so we could understand where that uh, misunderstanding came from. But this it wasn't allowed use prior to 07. So when it was constructed, just to piggyback on that, if I may, when it was constructed, when the, so the mechanic shop was there for a very long time in, in various forms, and we talked about that in January, I think. Um, but the apartments as built, when they were built, were permitted in this zone. And, and Tom's right, the, after reading through the letters, so Mrs. Norton came, and I'm not sure that we knew about this. Um, he, you know, again, he inherited these properties after the fact when his mom died, right? And then when his brother died, from his mom. Um, but she came, the, the town said, you know, you probably need to get an attorney and, and come back and fix this. But then it literally got recessed for three decades until this happened in 2015. Um, and so that's why, you know, as I'm categorizing it, it's to say I think that this is a solution to kind of bring today's zoning ordinance, which I think is what we want to talk about, to create as much conformity as we can, as possible. And I think that this does that by making the lots conform. Yes, Mr. Berry. So um, I think the one thing that may be missing from uh, Mr. Clark's uh, representation in our presentation is the special the footnotes that Mr. Clark is talking about is a section in your ordinance called special provisions it's 8.1 and in 8.1 it specifically talks about 
how to allow these uses in this zone, and that's the reasoning for the frontage uh, expansions and the landmass expansions, because we want to stand here before you and say that we recognize that multifamily is no longer permitted, but we also want to make sure that we are as closely representing um, the uh, intent of the ordinance of 8.1 with these modifications. Um, so that's really the purpose of all of the lot line revisions. And it's the square footage requirements that we're, to, that we're referring to. So it's in 8.1 um, sub 2 sub 1. Um, and that's where you'll find this added square footage. And that's what Chris was talking about by expanding 54-2 further back, that, that's the reason for that. Um, so it's a good point to make, and I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, all right. So it's uh, time for questions from the board. Is uh, anyone want to go first, or I can just start randomly asking people? Excuse me, Mr. Attorney Lane, did I touch on the criteria? Sure, yep, absolutely. Yes, could you please go over the uh, criteria for the. Sure. Uh, yes, the five criteria, please. Can you just open our application here? So I did address these um, in writing substantially in my. I usually say I prefer to let the writing speak for itself, but um, the five criteria um, the variance will not be contrary to public interest. Spirit of the ordinance is observed. Substantial justice is done. The values of the surrounding properties are not diminished. And literal, literal enforcement of the provision of the ordinance will result in an unnecessary hardship. Everyone knows hardship number five. That's the one we always talk about. Um, and within that, there are two subcategories. No fair and substantial relationship exists between the general public purposes of the ordinance provision and the specific application of that provision to the property and the proposed use is a reasonable one. I'll take these quickly. So the first three variance criteria when we talk about them um, are extremely similar and usually really hard to kind of flesh out. But here, we're acknowledging that the public interest is to have um, as much compliance with the zoning ordinance as possible while allowing reasonable use of property. And here where we have essentially a homestead property owned by one family for you know a century, um, everything has been on this property for a long time. The different uses that are now on the property were permitted when they were constructed and just may not have been technically permitted with the town correctly. Um, and so I think that it's not contrary to the public, it's in the public interest to come back, grant the variance, and then move on to a lot line adjustment to create lots that comply with your ordinance. Um, the spirit of the ordinance, I think I captured that from what I just said, and substantial justice. I think those all, all three go to what I just said. Um, the values of the property, so every property has an inherent value, right? Um, if you go out to this neighborhood, without getting crazy, it's hard to tell, but there's, we know what the assessed value is, we know what the assessed value of the surrounding properties are, this property is substantially improved, and so are the acreage. Um, I think that by creating compliance here, it creates a, a theoretically more valuable property, right? Or at least evens out the zone, as it were. Uh, the hardship here is that the ordinance, if you think of hardship, in that the ordinance is being applied to these very uniquely shaped properties and properties that have structures on them that predate your zoning ordinance. Again, when you take an ordinance, which is essentially overlaid over specific geography, it immediately creates nonconformities. That's the nature of zoning. Um, here, where we have all of these structures that are already constructed, they've been in use for decades and decades in the way that they are, it would create an undue burden on the applicant um, to limit his ability to use his property in the way that it's been used for decades. So I think it is a real hardship that the ordinance is causing um, as it's changed over the years, this property just hasn't caught up with it. So in a way, we're compelling the applicant to 
create compliance where there is none, and I think that's possible. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, may Ms. Cash, like to ask some questions, or? Of course. Okay. Please. Please. <laughs> Um, Attorney Lanzetta, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have one question. So map 154.0, um, municipal records show that the owner is John Norton, um, that there was no transfer to um, Mr. Leslie Norton via probate. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, so I, I spoke with Lee about this. Uh, I think that it's very likely that the assessor's office just never was informed of the transfer, and it makes sense because in New Hampshire, our system is really bad. Um, the land use registry does not mirror the probate registry. So if something is passed through a testamentary process, so say a trust or a will, and it goes through probate, that record is then held in the archives of the, literally of the probate court in the county where the estate was, um, was probated, was, was put through the probate process. There is nothing that then compels a devisee to come to the land use registry and update that registry. There's also nothing in the probate process that would mandate that they come and update that necessarily with the town. Usually people do, right? There's some notice that, would, that they would get and they would come and provide that to the town. Here that hasn't happened. Um, the intent here is that if we do the lot line adjustment, we're going to draft new deeds for all of these properties, and, and at that point, those will be recorded in the land use registry, and then brought to the town. Um, and so, at that point, I, I would assume that it would change. So Lee has access to the the probate form of notice to cities and towns that's customarily filed in a probate proceeding if someone just acquires property via via a will. Sure. So that's missing. So I guess I would like to see that document because as far as I'm concerned, we don't have proof that Mr. Norton actually owns this until we receive that documentation. Do you happen to have a copy of that? I do. I don't have a, we, we don't have a reference. We don't have a copy with us, but I do have the reference to it on the plan. But it's just a reference to the probate. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that the actual notice to cities and towns was generated. Um, it's an actual process that happens mm -hmm. in, in a probate of, of a will if someone acquires real estate. It doesn't always happen, though. So I, I deal with this a lot. Unfortunately, it, 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 oftentimes that document um, is either done incorrectly or it's not done. Um, I've encountered this a lot, and I, it's back to back. I'm, I grew up here in the county. I was in Colorado for a long time and then worked in Mass for a long time, mm -hmm. right? And so this is something I've encountered more in the last three years than I, I never would have known that it would work this way. So I agree with you, there's a, there is a process. I do think that needs to be corrected. Um, I can certainly ask if that's a contingency um, to have we kind of go through these documents and see if we have anything. My gut instinct is likely that this is on record kind of in the bowels of the probate registry and that we would need to go do a little research to pull that file and, and see if we can figure it out. It wouldn't be on any. It wouldn't be on the, uh, the registry's website. There's nothing on the registry's website. So yeah, so yeah. we actually don't have a digital. That's one of the big problems. Okay. And with COVID, it's been a huge problem. I know a lot. You can't, yeah, you can't even. I, yeah, I have clients where we're dealing with some of these issues, where I have not been able to access the probate records in Rockingham since COVID started. It's still not open. Okay. Um, so it's a little tricky right now, but that doesn't mean we can't consider it out. Um, so I guess my question is whether or not we have authority if, if the title is not in the applicant's name. If, if we don't have proof that the applicant is the owner of the property, there's nothing in the town records, the, the applicant hasn't provided anything, the, the town records indicate that it's still in his uncle's name. So I don't know, I'm just looking for some guidance from my fellow ZBA members. If, do we table it and wait for the, the documentation? Do we proceed? Well, um, I'm going to first ask Tom if he has any thoughts on that. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, I understand what Mr. Uh, Attorney Lanzetta is saying, and if I may ask, is that um, kind of a standard operating procedure for inheritance through wills, et cetera, that that document is not 
generated? From what I've seen um, in dealing with some massive, just doing some very, very large estate work, just in the last five years in New Hampshire, I've encountered this more often than not, and it's an unfortunate situation because it creates this sort of problem. Um, there may very well be a simple solution. We might have a document in his files that might help. Um, I know he inherited it. It's been represented to me that he inherited it, that, that, you know, these properties from his family members. And I've seen a number of deeds to that effect, but um, we can certainly chase the title as a contingency to, to get that cleaned up. I think that regardless, if we do, if we were to be approved tonight and then also go through the lot line adjustment process, we would be issuing new deeds at that point, and we would need to do back title for that. And, you know, sure, sure. Um, unrelated but related, the, some of you may remember this. This abutting piece of property used to be owned by the Davids. And as part of that estate, um, the settlement of the estate when it went to Lee, Lee actually had to transfer this front piece to the Dagles as part of that also. And so the town has actually already executed and allowed a lot line revision based on Lee's ownership of this piece of property. I believe uh, that was an application by the Dagles. Um, it was, but it had to also be uh, signed by Lee being the, the owner of the estate. I believe that I saw something in the records that John Norton gave Lee Norton authority to act on his behalf. John Norton had, had, passed had he away. passed at that, that time? Because I did see yeah. in the records. Yeah. Um, I do have more questions, and I guess we can decide. I mean, so I'm I, not I sure think if we're putting the card in so the door. So. Can I just, I just when we approved at the beginning of the year the automotive shop under Lee Norton's name, correct? We did. With the presumption that he owned the property. Yes. He does that, own that, that property. Was, well, that's a different piece of property. It's a different property. Right. 54, but that's 54-2. Right. But with taking the lot line adjustment away, because, oh uh, no, because the apartments are on 54. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, okay, okay. 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 No, that's. Um, just yes. quickly, I think Sorry. that if you submit an application for a lot line adjustment, you actually are, you have to show the deeds for each property that you're adjusting. So you would have to produce that document. That's what I'm saying. With your lot line adjustment. Right. So if there's a, yeah, if there's a contingency here to chase the title, we're, we're going to do that anyways in order to draft the new deeds we have to. If that to me, oh, having a real estate background, to me, I'm sorry, that doesn't that doesn't satisfy me. To me, you have to have the right title and interest to submit an application. Okay. But that's my opinion as as the sitting zoning board member. I understand. Um, Tom, Mr. Chairman, what if you were, you know, based on the information submitted, um, you could certainly act on the variance, but make a condition that that document be presented prior to the lot line adjustment going to the planning board. And if that doesn't show up, then the variance isn't valid. So you, you, that prior to, we act on the variance, but prior to the matter going for the zoning board. Planning board. Planning board, sorry. The document would have to be produced to who? To the planning board. One. As part of the application for the lot line adjustment. And, and Sarah has said that that would have to be attached to the lot line adjustment anyways, right? right. I mean, right. I guess other options tonight are we could um, add contingencies or we could also theoretically recess something we do for 30 years. Um, and, um, and, 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 you know, and allow, and then come back at a later date and allow another be allowed to be presented uh, in the here and now. Um, Ms. Mears, any thought on this? I'm okay with it being a condition of the variance application. Mr. Leach, I agree with. You. Okay. I agree. Okay. Yeah. So, Perfect. all right. So, 
any more? Any questions? I more? do have additional yes, questions. Um, so I'm going to ask you to go through each property with me. So um, map 154 is 210 Clement Road um, in the name of John Norton that Lee acquired from his uncle. It is the, the farmhouse property mm -hmm. yes. that I would like you to clarify how many residences are currently in that property. Mm -hmm. there, there's one. So it's just the farmhouse, a well, single family residence, me, no apartments. Well, let me rephrase. Mm -hmm. Can we discuss this? There's, this is the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. There's, There are two units in this building. And what is that building? That is the mechanic shop. And that mechanic shop happens to straddle the lot line with 54 and 54 2. So I say one because the intent was to have the house on a big piece of property mm -hmm. and add the two units to the mechanic shop. But the Nortons at the time does not know where this lot line was. Okay. But for all intents and purposes, the intent, what the intent is there is currently one single family residence in the original farmhouse. Yes. No additional dwelling units, no accessory dwelling units, just a single family home. That's correct. One family living mm -hmm. in. Okay. And 220 Clement Road, how many dwelling units currently exist? And what is the lot number associated with that? 154.2. Two. Two. Yes. Two units. So there's the business. Yep. And then two accessory dwelling units. Uh, apartments. And two apartments. Okay. Yeah. And then. But that technically two. isn't all in 50. Sorry. In a yeah. but that's, but technically, if the lot line doesn't exist, like we just said, the two apartments are on 54, mm -hmm. not 54 2 right now. Mm -hmm. but, right. So currently existing on 54, according to that lot line, is three units. Yeah. Uh, one house, one one house, two point seven five, and two units. Yeah, two point seven five. A house, two two apartments, yeah, we can and a business. Yeah. Or bathrooms or bathrooms because because the automotive yeah. is on the right. true fifty four two. Right. right. Yes. Okay. okay. And then two thirty Clement Road, which is mapped on lot one dash fifty five dash zero. Yeah. How many units are on that property? Two. There are two. There are two. There were three. There are now two. Okay, so there's the, the home. Yep. There's the garage in the back with an apartment above it. And Oops. then there's a garage on the right with an apartment above it. Right, that's no longer that's being no used. Longer that's being no used. longer being used. Yes. But there was an apartment constructed. There was. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Which I believe he, I, I do believe he got building permits for that. Um, not exactly. Okay. <laughs> 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 He, he received a building permit from the select board at the time for an additional living area okay. so that he could use it as a family room and then an office for that additional living area, but it was a specific condition on it that it not be used for a dwelling unit. Okay. So subsequent to the construction and the inspections for the additional living area, he um, added the utilities, the appliances, etc. to to make an apartment, okay. but the apartment was not issued. Uh, permit was not issued for the apartment. Okay. He he does understand that that is no longer being used. Yes, he, and he's I believe he's understood that for since this kind of started. Yes, I I went out there to take that off the list that Mr. Barry and I first came up with a couple of years ago. Um, at least we could eliminate one thing, and I did confirm that that apartment is no longer in use. Okay. But the building permit did specifically say that the building was not intended for residential purposes. Okay. So, Mr. Norton ignored the building permit. Okay. That's all the questions I have thus far. Okay. Mr. Lee, I'm going to start all over again from the most basic thing. What are we... What is the violation or the requirement of the, that you're, that you're seeking a variance for? In the 
I don't know if you have copies of your zoning. Let, let me see if I understand it. It's, it's the lot size isn't adequate to support the number of units. Well, okay. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. Assuming, yeah. assuming that a multi dwelling unit. I've been living this for 10 years, so yeah. I think I could do it. The fundamental problem is that this little lot that was built, or that the shop was built on. Yep and the duplex was constructed behind. Yep. To have a duplex in this zone, yep. you have to have a certain amount of frontage. Okay. And you have to have a certain land mass. Okay. If you go over a certain amount of frontage and a certain land mass, you start colliding with okay. this single family does house. The, does the zoning board agree that yes. that is the crux of what we're... Okay. We're approving three units, not Got two. It. Got it. That's the yep, right. that's the crux. Got it. Right. Which is and permitted in the zone as one zone. Based right. on the lot line adjustment right, right there proposed. Yes. Got it. Thank you. And so this this proposed frontage and this land mass would comply with special provision eight point one if it were actually on the list of permitted uses. Okay. So that's where the ordinance when we talk about that discrepancy can be relatively confusing. Um, because it's pretty clear that the drafting, which takes more time than necessarily the checkbox of the table of uses, would permit a multi-unit, which is defined as three or more, right, um, in this particular zone, so at this location, as long as you have the requisite land mass and frontage, which Chris has provided for here. Don't say another word, okay. lest I become confused yet again. <laughs> and as clear as I'll ever be on this matter. Okay. Tomorrow may be different. All right, no more questions? Mm -hmm. Mr. Leach. I have no questions. I think you've answered it. We're trying to approve three units. Contin and, and again, I'm full blown contingent on ownership and lot line being approved. Um, but I think if, if that's being done, I'm okay. okay. Ms. Venus? Yeah, so I had a question about the size or the square footage of the duplexes. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have? I, I don't have the square footage. You're asking the square footage of the actual units? Yeah. I don't have those square footages. And the existing house that's on the lot? Uh, I don't have that square footage. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. that, and the that, commercial use. That may be on the assessing card, okay. the existing I may have them right here. Just one second. If we don't, I'm happy to um, provide those. Yeah, a breakdown of each. Is this on town water or sewer? No. So we'll also need a new septic design for the commercial building of the duplex. Um, and the well that's on site is sufficient for all of the uses. Okay. With, with the proper radius. And would you be submitting a site plan? Um, Josh and I haven't discussed that. If, if the provisions of 8.1 were to actually be required, then a site plan would be required. But because multi-use is not permitted in the zone, 8.1 is really not permissible. I don't know whether a site plan is required or not. I think we're simply stating that if if multifamily was permitted in the zone, we wanted to comply with 8.1 as much as possible. Okay. From so, a zoning standpoint. Uh, according to the zoning ordinance, the Rollinsford Planning Board shall require site plan review for multiple dwelling units. And I think given that there's a commercial use and multiple dwelling mm -hmm. units, the site plan would be inappropriate. And, and I've, I've talked to Lee about that. And I think he'd be able to, that, that's okay with us. Um, yeah. We can meet the frontage and buffering and screening requirements that are in 8.1 there also. Um, so I think that would be, that's fine with us. I'm not good enough at math. Okay. I'm not good enough at math on the fly to take your assessing cards and figure out the square footage. So if you'll permit me to get a calculator and do that after the hearing, um, I think we can probably figure this out. Based on, I think the town has the info, but I can't do it. That's why I'm a lawyer. 
That's why you go to med school. <laughs> I'm not sure the apartments, the square footage of the apartments around we the may have, Yeah, we, we, can, we can go get that for you. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's not, yeah, that's not reflected on the assessing cards. Any more questions, Ms. Mears? No, that's it for right now. All right. I'm going to ask some questions, and I find this a little bit confusing, and so I'm going to... Uh, I think my, my confusion evidence. So... In return, in regard to the relief that you're seeking, is any of the relief that you're seeking have to do with um, seeking permission to have multi-unit dwellings where none are allowed? We're yeah, so <laughs> yes. Although we're we're somewhat we're straddling the fence of what are we applying? Is it the table of uses or do the special provisions apply? So what, we've, so what we're asking for is a variance from essentially the table of uses to say we're permitting a multifamily three units in this zone because it's not listed as permitted use while reserving the right to assert that it's likely that if you were to play knockout with the table of uses versus the special provisions that the language, because that is so much more specific, would possibly apply. So we're, we're at, simply, we're asking for a variance from the table of uses to permit a multi-dwelling, um, multi-family dwelling in, in the zone. And so, no, no, just to be clear, no new construction. Exactly. But with what the, to, just it's, to it's simply, recalibrate. It's simply the reshuffling the deck of cards that's there. So, what I recall, I, and I recuse myself on the prior issue regarding commercial building, but you know, it's my understanding that the commercial building, the commercial use of that building predated the zoning laws. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, tell me about the apartments that are currently there, or the, you know, the multi, the individual dwelling units. How, for instance, um, the one that is in back of the garage behind Mr. and Mrs. Norton's residence. How long has that been in existence for? Do you need to I don't know the answer to that, but I, but to, yes. an, to answer maybe the line of thinking, that's a permitted use of the zone. That's a permitted use of the zone. Because right. it's that's, only two on right. that lot. Because what? It's just two units on that lot. Um, also, I, I don't know, we could find out from Lee, but I do know from what he's told me when I've been out there, just anecdotally that the tenant that's been living there I think has been there for like 30 or 40 years possibly. They, I mean they raised their, I think they might have had even raised their children. I think they've been there a very long time. We can get that information though. Alright, and in regard to the the two units associated with the commercial building, there are two apartments, or no, I guess I'm confused. Two minutes behind the okay. one single family house. Yeah. That makes the three. Okay. Um, I was going to try and help the chair. And I'm, and I'm sorry to be struggling with this. So the, the commercial building has two apartment units behind it. Yes. It's attached. Attached. Right. And those have been in existence for how long? Since the early 90s. And so is it your contention that? For what period of time did the zoning ordinances allow those that you know, allow multifamily units there on that property? Uh, until 2007, I think. Since 2007? Right? Until two, 2007 is when the ordinance changed, I believe. Yes. And that's when the table of uses became in conflict with the special provisions in 8.1. So tell me, that, I'm sorry. Sorry. So tell me, so in, in, uh, one thing I'm struggling with is the idea that there's been some intentional nonconformance with the town zoning laws for a, a significant period of time, and the applicant wants relief from it. Um, and I guess I'm struggling with that concept of, for lack of a better word, thumbing your nose that maybe that's too strong a language. How about this, John? 
Whether it was intentional or not, he inherited it. Mr. Norton himself committed none of these infractions. He did not. You know, and to me that matters. That matters because that says to me he's operating in good faith. He's hired a lawyer. He's trying to make it right. I have good, good trust that he isn't going to use this as an allowance to go build, you know. And, 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 and that, that weighs a lot in my thinking. We made it nonconforming. Right. Exactly. The town made it nonconforming. Exactly. I don't concur with you, Mr. Norton. So before 2007, three units were permitted. But there's a building application that specifically does not allow that a residential dwelling unit above the garage that Mr. Norton That's on a different ahead. property. Different issue, that's that's a different property. That's not actually, it's today. actually not. It's part of this. It's on the, in the barn. Yeah, it's, a, it's in the garage. But none of that but is that's, part of this But variance. that's not part of this variance. Yeah. And it that's is. not rectified. But it is. It's not. No. We're only getting relief for the for the uh, Damn, I thought I was for the confused. for the two apartments in the single family house. From what I understand, correct? Well, well they're all lumped together. They're all part of the application. So if we approve mm -hmm. the application, we're no, approving he makes all no, of them. He makes no mention of that. Yeah. In so his application. I might be able to clarify that. But, so I agree. They were part of the original concern that brought all this to bear. And, you know, Tom's letter from 2020. The, but to me, it's much simpler, at least this part simpler. The only reason that lot 55, where Lee's home is now, it has, or is located, has been moved the whole time, is part of this, is because when we reconfigured the lots to do the lot line adjustment, we needed to just shuffle that lot line out. We're not here to permit or deal with those issues. He, whether or not did or not, took action on his property. Tom figured that out, talked to him, and stopped. Um, we're only dealing with Lot 55 to just slightly reapportion the frontage as part of the lot line adjustment. The variance deals with Lot 54, 2, and, 50, and 54 to fix that lot line. And what's been represented to me is that the family didn't understand that there was a lot line under that structure. The intent was to put a duplex, which was permitted then in 1990 when it was built, and would be permitted now in 2021. The intent was to put the duplex on lot 54 2 only. What they didn't have right, which happens a lot here, is the location of their lot line. And that's why I said, I'm not, you know, I said it intentionally. I believe the family is something that's like homesteading on this property for a hundred years. So I find it pretty reasonable to think that you're coming I mean, in the lots team, right? The driveways are all connected. It's probably pretty easy to do that. You know, I mean, I can tell you, my parents have a tree farm with the house built in 1775. They have three lots that make up the farm. It's their property. They have no idea where the lots are. I mean, they've been there for 50 years. I can actually run to that. We were originally hired by John Norton to do the subject design mm -hmm. for the garage and the like this. And it was at that time, we we're talking 2009, it was at that time that we found that there's this little lot and it goes right through the middle of the structure. The Nortons had no idea. They, they, they act as though this is all one big piece of property. In their mind, that's how this operates. That's kind of how we, that's how we got to where we are. That's right. Tom, can I ask you this help clarify my mind? Is the issue that prior to the zoning change in 2007, 2008, except with the exception of the, I was going to say the lot line, that the units in back of the commercial building were a permitted use? Prior to 07, yes. Okay. And so why So why would we be using a, uh, I don't know. Special exception? I, maybe, I don't know. I just, I'm just. Um, well, I think that the, the thought was at one point that they could be grandfathered because of that. And, you know, the zoning change did modify it, but the two issues were, they straddled the lot line, which nobody knew. And even though it was a permitted use, they did not come in for any permits. It was constructed 
It was just constructed. So if they were to come in now, and it, even if it were an allowed use right now, they would have to come in for building permits, and we would say, it straddles a lot line, we couldn't do it. We'd have to come back for this lot line adjustment. So the variance takes care of the minimum performance. Yes. Way to do it. Okay. And um, if, if we were to grant that this uh, variance material that so it would this allow um, the applicant of any of the lots to further add other units? He would need to come back before the board to, so right now, the way that we're approaching this, by asking for relief from the table of uses and not focusing on the idea that we think is permitted to take from the lot. So I'm just saying, yeah, the table of uses says no multi-family in Sarawak, in, in Wallensburg. Okay. To come back with another multi, anything over two, you've got to come back. And, and that's where, when I say the duplex was intended to be on 54 two, and that would have been committed then or now, we're, really what we're trying to do is take a step here to then fix the lot lines and make each lot as conforming as possible to, to, to today's zoning limits. So that's, that's the interest behind it. And I think, I, when I first looked at this, I can tell you anecdotally, this hit my desk and I had about three hours to send a letter, maybe maybe four, to send a letter to appeal the administrative decision that first time I was in front of you for the commercial use. I had kind of none of the right information, quickly looked at your ordinance, hadn't read it in a while, and then to write them off a letter and pretend like I knew what I was talking about, right? Um, and I initially thought, why would we do it this way? And then after talking to Chris, who has been doing this for years now, working to solve this, it made a lot of sense. I think there's only one way to approach it, and that's this way, is it's two part, it's, you know, take a couple of steps to get the property to move out. And then ask you a couple, couple more questions. And why not, why isn't this more properly as a special exception? It's right. So it's not permitted. So usually you apply the special exception. I'd have to look at the table of uses, but off the top of my head, um, we would use that vehicle for a use that is permitted, and we're saying that the table doesn't permit it. And that's where Kevin and I, when I say we talked about, well, what are we using the table or 8.1? And I think our idea was by trying to apply 8.1 when we know the town doesn't want to apply it, we're just saying, hey, let's go do it, right? And no one wants that. We just want to solve it. So by saying, okay, we'll acknowledge that there's possibly this error in the ordinance, but we'll ask for that relief, I think that gets us to resolve the issue. But I, I think we need, we need to be a different structure in that table to use a special exception. All right, I think my last question is, in regard to the five factors, um, that there won't be any diminishment of surrounding properties, um, can you address that a little bit more as to why um, you say that, you say that it would likely, are you saying if we, if we grant the variance, it would likely increase comparable neighboring property values? So, that would be my opinion that from doing this kind of day in and day out, that if we create lots that are performing that are immediately marketable, right? Like right now, 54.2 can't be sold, I mean 54.2 and 54 can't be sold, nothing can be done with these lots until this is compliant. Mm -hmm. So you would create immediate conformity with the ordinance, which is good for all of the abutters and the town because you're applying uniform zoning ordinance to property that is innately, no property in the middle of uniform. But also, by isolating the units on each property, that property is now valued as, okay, this is a property with three permitted units. And so it it will, I think, raise the comps if you're looking at it from just a straight appraisal standpoint, because the units are permitted and they know where they are. Whereas right now, and then, and then the kind of tangential analysis is that nothing is changing. We're not proposing any structural changes here to anything. So if the property is valued at X now, that value is just going to roll forward 
after this is done. And so if we were coming in and saying, all right, we're going to tear this down and build this, and, and that again would increase the property values anyways because new construction is done. So I, I think that it's likely to do three or four you know, orders in this scenario. And does granting the variance, would it have the effect of actually making the property more valuable from a tax standpoint from the town? I or no difference? So. I'm not sure how these are being taxed right now, but I know that when they're done, we're going to be taxing, you know, lot 55 as a single family standalone, plus that apartment building the garage. Lot 54 2 will have three units, we'll know the square footages, and give you a very accurate assessment. And then lot 54 will be uh, vacant land and assess the back up. So I think it, it should clarify it. There's not uh, likely a current use uh, penalty fee that will have to be also. I'm sorry, say that again? There would likely also be a current use penalty fee that would be assessed also. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Any more questions for the board? Ms. Mayors. Yeah, I just have a question on map uh, 1 lot 54 2. How come that wasn't subdivided? Did it not meet the use calculations? When? On You're saying, sheet one of three, that could be potentially subdivided. You wouldn't have to be in front of you. The little, the, the little lot? I'm going to kick this over. It's not one. Uh, it has to do with that. Uh, it doesn't need subdivides? Oh, and frontage. Frontage. Yeah. Because okay. then, then you have a duplex and you have to have more frontage for a duplex. So you have to see a frontage? You have to have 150% of 180 feet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions on this, please? No. Right, thank you. So this time I'm going to open it up for uh, comments from the public. And uh, we'll see if there's a gentleman in the back who's been patiently waiting. Um, and if you would state your name and address and then Please uh, offer your comments, sir. I have no comments. I came to listen. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, all right. So, are we uh, ready to uh, deliberate and or move to a vote? Ms. Katz? So, um, do we want to deliberate or do we want to just go to a vote? I mean, what's the feeling now? I'll go to Ms. Mears. Uh, I can go for a vote right now. I, I, would, I, would I would just like to say that before we go to a vote, I sure. want to discuss conditions. Here, yep. yeah. Okay, um, we'll have to do that. I would, I would like to, for everybody, close the public hearing. Oh, sorry, yes. Right? I'm going to close the public hearing then, yes. Thank you for the reminder. Yep. So, it's my understanding that that I think we should have conditions on this um, if it is to be approved. Conditions to be, you know, clear represent representation of ownership. Obviously, lot line approval by the planning board. Uh, and if I read, and I, and I, and I um, is it Mr. Christopher? Very Christopher. Um, the septic needs to be redesigned. So. Um, my conditions would be that clear ownership, lot line approved by the planning board, and state approval of the septic system for the multi. And just a point of clarity, you're going to have one septic system for the shop, the two units, and the single family house. No, nope. the okay. single family house is on its own system. Okay, great. So the shop and and and, two and what is the water supply for? Uh, currently, they share a well, so I would show the well. On the All plan. four. Mm -hmm. No. What shares the well? Uh, all four, yes. All four. Shop, yeah, shop. Two units in the same family house. Yes, all share well, and that is adequate according to you. Yes. Fine. Then I'm just concerned about the sewer being approved for the shop and two units uh, approved by the state. That's my So three decisions. conditions. Three conditions. All right. So I have a question for my fellow 
members of the board. So my understanding is lot 154.2, while it is a permitted use according to our zoning ordinance, it was never permitted to have these apartments attached to the business. Mm -hmm. So by granting this variance, we are allowing the applicant to continue utilizing the apartments that were never, that he never sought approval for. He never obtained a building permit, he never got permission, he just built it and now is asking for forgiveness. Right, it's not a yeah, so it turned yeah, it's, it's a sheet. Not the previous owner. You're correct. Yeah. Did you want to see the screens? Yeah, um, I don't know if I could add another couple of conditions, potentially. Well, let's address Andrea's. Yeah, right, sure. Let's, address let's get back to that. Um, I, I, I so hear what you're saying. I don't have a problem with it. I, I think it's a bit of existence. <laughs> it's, you know, Looks I'm like not, a duck I'm quacks like a duck. It's it, it's no. a duck. No, you're not mistaken. Okay, that That's me. probably happened multiple times throughout, you know, little tiny towns like ours. And really, um, and, and, and to, to to Lee's point, he inherited it. It was his mom that built it, it wrong. In, in 1990, <laughs> his mother was the one that built those units, and the 91 application is signed by her. And they didn't want to do with that. Um, and and the town kicked it back down the road. That's the one the town that's didn't address. That's so. until, that's right. until, until I was in front of you, or I guess until technically, I guess, maybe it was you. I think, I don't know, I have to think about that for a second. I think it might have been until I was in front of you on an appeal of the administrative decision that had been recessed for three decades. So it just never got sorted out by the law. And, and, it, and you combine that with the fact that the applicant himself he may or may not have been aware of that, but it's hardly even germane to this application. I mean, I agree, Andrea. The last thing we want to do is grant people permission to go go create more infractions. But I don't see this as, at all in this way. Um, and I, I mean, I think we got a shirt for eye right now. What happened 30 some odd years ago? You know, that's, it, we have to own a little bit of it too. They came to us. We didn't do, not we. The select board didn't do it. Right. So we're now just like just like Lee is. We've inherited this issue, and you know, I, I'm sure that happens. But in my mind, that version would be a hand scratch thing on this application form, in which the applicant comes in and basically says, "It is what it is." You know, I and mean, that is not that. I mean, this, this guy is showing a good faith every effort to uh, to make it right. You're exactly. Right. I mean, the applicant says right in his application of the history and the narrative that, you know, it's a family compound, so to speak, and he's lived there for 67 years. I just, I don't think that I buy the premise that he didn't know. He may or may not. We'll never know. I'm not, I'm not sure it really informs our decision either way. That's my biggest misgiving about this whole issue. Uh, but. He is coming forward to uh, clear it up. As I understand, the town's in support of this, um, and there's not going to be. This is not going to allow any further non-compliance with the zoning or, or, or permitted uses. So I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, I, that was my biggest reservation. Also. Um, all right. So. I mean, I'm just one more. I'm going to say the precedence we're setting here is if someone in town who's lived here for a hundred years comes to us and says, "Oh, by the way, I just identified, you know, that I had a funky lot line." Once again, they'd have to come to us with forgiveness. Maybe that happens. Maybe you know. I think you know. We all know the Norton compound. We've all been driving past it a thousand times. You know, so I don't. I can't identify, and I know I've only lived here for 20 years, another property similar to that. I don't know if the audience can, to, can provide anything else. Yeah. So I know it's Mitchell, I have And it would have complied in, when it was constructed, it would have complied. I think that's the, 
the, the purring might not have been done correctly, but Mrs. Norton, who I've never met, she's previously you know, been uh, dead for quite some time, she did come and then it did get recessed and then it never was brought up again. But if it had gone forward there for the use that she was trying to get, and at that time they didn't understand that there was that lot line, would have likely, very likely been approved because she was looking for a duplex on 542. And so that's where it, it, I understand the concern about forwarding non compliance or something, but we are asking for forgiveness in a sense because she tried, it got recessed. We're here in 2021 compared to 1990. <laughs> it's a long time and it's a different applicant. It's not even the same person. So it would have applied. Michelle, yeah, well, Ms. Mears, we have some other uh, potential conditions. Uh, yeah, I would think that this would need site plan approval so we can have a site plan on record with the town. Uh, and the board should seriously consider that. Can you explain that? Uh, so each use be listed out on a site plan to make sure that we're in compliance with some of the site plan regulations. And if they are not in compliance with those, ask a waiver for those regulations. Um, like buffering between different properties, uh, making sure that the lot coverage, uh, they have enough lot coverage out there, making sure that the outdoor storage of materials for the automotive use, we know where that is. Uh, I think that should all be listed on the plans that, and, and go through the planning board approval process. And uh, also, if we could have um, the square footage of each unit um, have some kind of record of that so we know if this gets built upon. Yeah. Right. Would that be, yeah. Would that be included in the site plan? And then I just had another question about the well. Would it require a community well? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Okay. No. Uh, no. Emphatically, no. Tom, can I ask for your input on the site plan proposal, the requirement of site additional on site plan? I, I think it makes sense because it, the um, there's a provision in the ordinance that does, in the zoning ordinance, that does require that for multifamily, which was not part of that 8.1. Yeah, well, that, that's a current regulation, so I think that's a good idea. I, didn't that get brought up? During the administrative decision appeal, that if it were granted, it would have to come in. That was no. Uh, yeah, no. no. When you and I had talked, spoke about that because remember, you and I were operating as if it was in a lot of use for many, many months, and then maybe we were going to operate under 8.1. And then Kevin was the one that pointed out that um, yes, yeah, it was not in use because 8.1 does require a site plan. Right. Right. But. This board certainly has the authority in granting the variance to make that a requirement. And we're okay with that. Yeah. Okay. I've already discussed that with our client. Awesome. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely, sure. And can I still ask the applicant a question? Sure. So I'm just curious about the lot line adjustment for map 155 that is just the tiniest little adjustment. Yeah. What's the purpose of that? It does what? One, uh, map one lot 55 does not have the proper amount of measured frontage for a duplex lot. So what is it short? A foot? Two well, feet? Three feet? Five feet. Five feet. Okay. Which is why I moved it five feet. Okay. <laughs> and that has to do with the way the deed read versus what we measured in the field. You know, uh, what everybody thinks they own and what they actually own when I go out and measure it. That's kind of the difference. Okay. I would ask for one more condition that um, on map one, lot 55, that the owner only has permitted one apartment and that the second garage with the second apartment, I think that we need to ensure that it's not a livable space, that it be uh, removed. And I mean, I don't know if we can do that. It's well, not permitted. I, I, yeah, I remember that the, the permit was for additional living area. The select board note on it was not another dwelling unit. 
Right. Fixes. But there so, are two garages with two. Right. Well, the, the second one, or the first one, <laughs> that's been there. The, the one in the back. The one in the back's been there. The one in the back has. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the sec. Back. It's the second one. Right. That's one, not inhabited. Right. Well, the kitchen has been approved, right? Right. It has. Yeah. Okay, that was my question. Oh. Okay. That was yeah. my question. That was yes. what I was trying to get at okay. without, I yeah. guess I should have just said. Can we remove the kitchen, the plumbing, to, to ensure right. Right. Yeah, it can't be lived yeah. in yeah. the future? That was done about a year As a condition, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think to Tom's point, <laughs> the council has an enforceable condition in the original approval. So if somehow, you know, the kitchen pops up, that's an easy citation and then that's what we can back in front of you guys. So it's, it, that condition is there. Thank you. All right, great. All right, so I think we're ready to vote. Can we just, so oh. the, the, the four conditions are ownership, lot line approval, sewer, site plan review. Yes. Square footage of each. That's going to be in the site plan review. In site plan review. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. And I, so I think. Now we spent a lot of time on this tonight. Um, do we want to go through each element or just vote? No. All right. I think we've debated. Okay, I'm just trying to not my eyes across my teeth. At least don't. That would jump from the ship. All right. So, um, would someone like to make a motion to uh, approve the, the grant the variance with the four conditions? All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. I'll, I'll do a roll call uh, vote. Um, Ms. Mears? Yes. Uh, Mr. Leach? Yes. Ms. Uida? Yes. Uh, Ms. Katz? No. Okay. And I am voting yes. Um, so, thank you. Congratulations. Did you write it down? Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I kind of write. <laughs> so I know we've been here for a while. I think there's a uh, oh, do we want to approve minutes? a couple more yeah. items of the agenda. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. So I think this is the next item whether or not to, to approve the notice of decision I wrote for the last. Can I just go over the condition? I mean, you'll yeah. yeah. see the minutes. Yeah. So it's. Proof of ownership, lot line approval by the planning board, state approval of septic redesign, and um, so mm -hmm. submission of a site plan for approval of the approved board. site approval. Okay. And the okay. ownership okay. issue as well. That was right. the first. That was the first condition. Okay. okay. Septic site plan review. Notice the cities and towns. And lot line adjustment. Lot line adjustment. Yeah. Lot line approval. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I got Okay. I All got right. It. So next item I think is. Uh, the, the decision I wrote, no, it's not a decision, so. So I just, I put that on the agenda because I thought that the board should just discuss how we're going to approve it because you did have that question about whether it was technically um, enforceable because the board hadn't approved the mm -hmm. notice of decision, but we kind of had that discussion of like, well, the board doesn't meet regularly and it meets like, it meets longer than the, Thing is supposed to be submitted by. So, like, I don't know if you guys want to discuss it. It just was an issue that came up that I thought maybe while we're together we, oh. we could address. Why don't we uh, handle it this way? Uh, we just wanted to make a motion to approve the decision that I wrote for Trayer 2106. Good to be, that's fine. But to be honest, there's like a bunch of outstanding notices of decision that have not been Okay. Oh. We did talk about this, and um, the minutes get approved by the board. And the notice of decision is basically a summary of the minutes. So I. Why, why did they have to be approved? Yeah. Right. That's. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm. I'm thinking. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I apologize. I was trying to again die as a cross T's. Yeah. yeah. Once okay. We, once you approve the minutes, I mean that's the final document. The notice of decision doesn't get logged anywhere. I mean it's. It's yeah. the notice of decision, but the minutes are the basis of the case. All right. And again, like I just brought it up to that yeah. we're all yeah. on the same page yes. yeah. with that. Okay. It's been a long night. Uh, can we? Is anything wrong with approving the the minutes in one fell swoop, or do we have to do nope. it? 
You can do that. All right. Would someone make, like to make a motion to approve the minutes of March 25th, July 8th, and July 22nd, 2000? I'll make a motion. All right. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. All right. I thank you all. Anything else? I'll make a wanna... motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> all right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> I thank you all for your...